here on the web. Thank you. Uh, so let me start today by just reminding you of the important points from the first uh, lecture. So we are interested in studying a class of sequences called automatic sequences. And we have three equivalent models for working with such sequences. One is you construct your sequence by iterating a k-uniform morphism and then possibly um, relabeling the alphabet. Second model is the sequence is computed by a finite automaton with output, where you compute the nth term of the sequence by writing n in base k, feeding that to the automaton, and the automaton will output the nth term of the sequence. Uh, the third equivalent model is that uh, this is equivalent to um, the set of uh, natural numbers that can be defined in an extension of Presburger arithmetic, which is the first order theory of the natural numbers with addition. And the extension is that we add this function vkx that tells you the largest power of k that divides x. And what is important is that that uh, extension of Presburger arithmetic is decidable. And what that means for us is that there is an algorithm that can decide any property of a given automatic sequence that can be expressed in this first order logic. So for today, today is mostly going to be um, a lot of examples of different properties of automatic sequences that people have been or may be interested in historically, at least um, or mainly from the combinatorics on words point of view. And I'll show you the property, how you would express this in the first order logic, and then how you can input that into Walnut and have it decide true or false, um, as the case may be. So we'll start, first property I'll start with is the property of um, periodicity. So this is one of the sort of early properties that people actually considered and tried to figure out, is this a decidable property of automatic sequences? Um, here's the definition for a sequence to be ultimately periodic. Uh, it's written here in a sort of uh, logical uh, notation, right? Basically, there should be some period P and some pre-period, in this case, N, such that after the first n terms, the, the ith term will repeat p positions later, right? So, of course, you can write this in, um, a, in our first order logic like this, right? So there exists a period p, a pre-period n, um, such that for all i greater than n, a i repeats again at position i plus p. So let's just check. As an example, let's take the sequence defined by iterating this three uniform morphism. 0 goes to 0, 1, 0. 1 goes to 1, 0, 1. Um, well, it's obvious from the morphism that this will generate something periodic. But just as an example, Let's, um, let's see how to do it um, in the, the software Walnut. So these are the commands that you would type in uh, to the program in order to perform this check. So as we saw last time, you 
input a morphism by the morphism command. You just, you know, say what the images of each letter are, give it a name M. Promote converts the morphism into the equivalent uh, automaton with output that computes the sequence. And then this uh, eval command, basically here you put the um, you know, first order logic description of uh, the property you're interested in, right? So what's important here is just this little bit here, which says that we are working in base three, most significant digit first, right? This is a three uniform morphism, so we will be working in base three in this case. And then the rest of the formula is just the translation into Walnut's syntax of that uh, logical formula. Remember again, E for exists, so exists PN, P greater than or equal to one, N by default is assumed to be greater than or equal to zero, if I don't say anything more about it. This symbol for and, for all i, i greater than or equal to n implies that this word at position i equals same word at position i plus p, right? So you input this command into walnut and walnut will do what it does and in this case we'll output true. Right, because this sequence is indeed periodic. Okay, so that's one combinatorial property that we may or may not be interested in, right? Testing if some given automatic sequence is periodic. Uh, historically, um, these kinds of constructions, these iterated morphism constructions have been used to construct sequences that avoid certain patterns, certain repetitions. So in other words, something stronger than being aperiodic. Uh, so let's start with, um, let's start with the, the property of um, containing overlaps. So an example of an overlap would be a word like entente, which is a word of length 2n plus 1 and period n, right? So you can see that this word has period 3, right? E repeats three positions later, n repeats three positions later, t and e again, right? So the word has period 3, it has length 7, so this is an example of an overlap. And it's not hard to write down a formula that says some, this sequence A contains an overlap, right? You simply say, okay, there exists some position I where the overlap starts, some period N greater than or equal to one, and then check from all J between zero and, uh, and N inclusively that uh, you know, each symbol matches N positions later, right? So you just, you check the periodicity um, here. Right, makes sense so far? Right, so that's, that's the, the definition in sort of logical notation of the property that A contains an overlap. So if I apply this um, formula to the 2A Morse word, which I showed you last time, Right, you remember the 2A Morse word could be obtained by iterating the map zero goes to zero one, one goes to one zero. So in Walnut, the 2A Morse word is already stored there as the word T, so I don't have to bother inputting the morphism and promoting it, he's already there. Um, this base two, Actually, I can omit that because by default it will assume that you're in base two if you leave that out. And just we translate again that formula, right? Exists i n n greater than or equal to one. And for all j 
j less than or equal to n implies t at i plus j equals t at i plus j plus n. So we input the formula. In this case, it will output false because it's testing the existence of an overlap. I should have maybe, maybe not called it overlap free since it's testing the opposite. It's testing whether there is an overlap and it's outputting false. Right, so there is no overlap in the 2A Morse word. Right, so this is, this is one of the early results of 2A, was constructing an infinite sequence on two syllables with this property. Contains no overlaps. Um, okay, so a square is something just like this, the same word repeated twice in a row. Frou-frou. Right, it's just a word that has the form x followed by x again. Right? So equivalently, it's a word of length 2n with period n. So to write down the formula for it is basically the same as the formula for overlaps. The only difference is here I'm just checking j strictly less than n, whereas before I went to j less than or equal to n because the word is, should be length 2n, not length 2n plus 1, right? So the formula is basically the same. So I would like to test that this particular automatic sequence contains no squares. In this case, this is a sequence over the three-letter alphabet, 0, 1, 2. At first, you start by iterating this two-uniform morphism over the four-letter alphabet, right? It's two-uniform morphism, so it's a two-automatic sequence, right? So you iterate this sequence over the four-letter alphabet, and you take the infinite word that you get over the four-letter alphabet, and then apply this relabeling of the alphabet. So basically, one and three both go to one, right? And you, are, you end up with this infinite sequence over a three-letter alphabet. I claim that this sequence has no squares, is square-free, right? And we can test it again with Walnut by entering the appropriate commands. So this time I have to provide the morphism to Walnut, so I do that here in the morphism command. I promote it to a DFAO. I now have to apply the, the coding morphism that relabels the alphabet. So I provide that. I apply it to the word I got before. And once all that setup is done, I simply, again, just encode my formula using Walnut's syntax in the usual way, right? So there it is. And again, Walnut will output false. It will tell me that this word is, yeah. Um, that's a good question. I actually will have to check the manual how it does that. I think maybe you, maybe you have to put the symbols in some kind of parenthesis. I can't remember, but um, we can check. Yeah. That's a mistake. You're right. Yeah, that's a mistake. That should be a, a big H word. Any other questions? OK, so again, this is one of the classical problems in combinatorics on words, constructing words that avoid squares. 
it's very easy to see you cannot do it over a binary alphabet. This result shows that you can construct infinite square free words over a three letter alphabet. On the binary alphabet though, you can avoid overlaps, which is the best you can do on the binary alphabet. Well, cubes, right? Cubes are defined in the same way as squares. If squares is, uh, if square, a square is the word xx, a cube is a word xxx, right? And again, you can define it in terms of a length and a period, and you can write down the appropriate formula. In this case, again, the only difference here is now we're checking j instead of before from 0 to less than n, we go from 0 to less than 2n. We check the periodicity, right? It's, it's all the same. So the 2a Morse word, already we know that it must avoid cubes since it avoids overlaps, right? But here's another morphism on a binary alphabet that I claim is cube-free. We can easily check this um, in the same way. There's no recoding this time. It's just a purely fixed, uh, a pure fixed point of this morphism. So I input it, I promote it to a DFAO, I input the formula for the cube, right? The, I now I'm working in base five because it is a five uniform morphism. All right, so I have to remember to put that there. And again, Walnut will tell me false. There are no cubes in this word. The word is cube free. So, squares, cubes, and in general, we can have k powers defined in the obvious way you would generalize this, right? Um, However, we can also define a power um, of rational exponent rather than just integer exponent, right? And we do it in essentially the same way. For any rational number, p over q, greater than or equal to 1, we'll say that a p over q power of period n is a word of length p over q times n and period n, right? Just same as we defined the integer powers. It's just that the length is now some rational number, p over q times n. And we also introduce this plus notation where the only difference in the definition is that a p over q plus power has length strictly greater than p over q times n. Just as an example, this word here, 1001001, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, is a 7 thirds power, right? Because, well, basically it's a square, right? A 2 power, but then it's followed by the first third again of the repeated part, right? So, it's not too hard, again, to translate this into a logical formula the same way we did before. You, again, just check this periodicity, right? You just have to make sure you check between the right bounds, right? Based on P over Q, right? So you just check the periodicity, in this case, between J from I to this number, I plus P over Q minus 1 times N and we just check that the periodicity holds for all such j. And same thing for p over q plus power, except this is a less than or equals. All right? Except, of course, that in this logic that we're using is a theory of the natural numbers, not, uh, not the rational numbers. So we can't actually write down these rational numbers in our formulas, so you just rewrite the inequality, multiply through by the denominator q, it's fine, right? So just rewrite that so that everything is involving uh, natural numbers, and now we can 
prove something stronger than what we did before. So the morphism I showed you that I said was cube free, it's actually better than that. It avoids uh, 8 over 3 plus powers. It does have 8 over 3 powers because it has this one here, right? 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, and then 1, 0 again. But it avoids no other, no powers of larger exponent. And, okay, it was a 5 uniform morphism, so we work in base 5. We input the formula, as you saw on the previous page, right? This is those you know, qj less than or equal to qi plus p minus q times n, right? And check the periodicity. Again, walnut returns false. The word has no 8 thirds plus powers, right? And I should say that it's, if you want to prove this by hand, it's, a fairly tedious bit of work. Not too hard, but I mean, it would take some work, especially if you weren't used to those kind of constructions. Yeah? So if you just take that there are no eight or <coughs> plus power, but there are these powers, I mean, this five times n, I think the formula is correct, but I can, um, I can double check again uh, to be sure. But I think in this case, yeah. So another type of repetition. We had integer powers, we have fractional powers. We can also talk about patterns using several variables. So an integer power is an example of a pattern with a single variable, right? XX, XXX, XXXX, right? You can easily define uh, a repetitive pattern using several variables. Again, in a should be fairly intuitive how the definition would work. So let's say I wanted to talk about words of the pattern x, y, y, x. Here's an example of what that means, right? Two would match the x, zero, one would match the y, and so two, zero, one, zero, one, x matches the pattern x, y, y, x, right? And you can define patterns like this over as many variables as you like. Right, and there's a whole theory of avoidability of these uh, types of patterns. Um, as an example of how to do this with walnut, we can show that the two-way Morse word contains no occurrences of the pattern x, y, y, x, y, y. So this first formula here is a convenient formula. Um, in general, when working with walnut, you're very often comparing that one factor of a certain length over here equals another factor of a certain length over there. So here is the formula to check that the factors of your sequence x of length n starting at position i and starting at position j are actually equal. All right, so there, there you check. Um, Here's the formula written in walnut notation. This particular formula is one that has a bunch of free variables. So walnut will not answer true or false. Instead, it will produce an automaton accepting the base two representations of 
the values of those free variables that satisfy the formula. Right? In this case, it will produce this automaton here. Right? It's pretty complicated. I don't think you will get any deep insight by looking at it. But the point is, you see that the edges are labeled by triples of digits, right? Because this is accepting the triples i, j, and n that satisfy the formula, right? That where at position i and position j, the factors of length n are the same. So it will accept all those triples, uh, i, j, n, right? And we discussed already, you know, how the, the triples of, of digits are read in parallel through the automaton, right? So you run that command somewhere, it will generate this big automaton. And now we can use that to check the equalities between the different pieces of this pattern, x, y, y, x, right? So we have to check, you know, I guess in this case, we're saying that x has length m, y has length n, and then we just check everything at the right place, right? The x will start at position i, the second x should start at position i plus m plus 2n to get over here, right? And then you just check that those factors of length m are equal, check that the y's are equal, check that the other y's are equal, check that the first half equals the second half, right? You just check all the, all the things that you have to check, right? And yeah, again, walnut will output false. There are no instances of x, y, y, x, y, y in the two-way Morse word. Another one that's useful uh, if you want to count, for example, how many factors of length n there might be, is this, uh, novel factors, which is basically just uh, saying that here is the first occurrence of this particular factor of length n, right? And in this case, the formula is simple. It just says for all j less than i, um, whatever I see, well, basically, whatever I see earlier than position i is different from the, what I see at position i. So at position i, this is really the first occurrence of something new of length n, right? So, for example, if you wanted to compute the positions and lengths of all novel factors in the 2A Morse sequence, so you would simply enter the formula here, and it will produce, in this case, an automaton accepting all the pairs, i and n, such that there is a novel factor of length n starting at position i, right? And here's the automaton reading pairs of digits, right? And, you know, if you wanted to, you could analyze this and see what sort of insight you might get from it. You'll notice that anything where i equals zero will take you right away over here to the accepting state because, of course, every prefix of length n is a novel occurrence, right? That's the first occurrence of something. Yep? I know the last about the, like, scoping and names. Like, if you have two free variables in there, and I guess that you are defining the predicate, which is true for those values or blah, blah, blah. Which is the, what is the order, or is it, like, statically, uh, is it, like, dynamically scoped? Is that now n, n refers, if you have an n in some formula, then it will use that n, or Alphabetically. 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 Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. And, and then when you, uh, I maybe did this on your previous slide, but then when you, uh, okay. Okay, this answers everything. Yeah. So yeah, that's why, yeah. That's why, for example, here, i comes before n. Yeah, just because it's all, it's all done alphabetically. Yeah, so when you call the function, 
uh, whatever values you're putting in will fill the free variables in their alphabetic order. Yeah, that's a good question. That's actually important to know. Otherwise, yeah, it's, it gets confusing figuring out how to call these things. Okay, another basic property um, in combinatorics on words, the idea of two words being conjugates of each other simply means that one word is a cyclic shift of the other word. Right, so again, pretty easy to write down as a formula. Basically, it just means that, well, if you take one word, you can cut it in two pieces and read from wherever you cut it, wrap around and read from the beginning, and those things should match, right? So we can check that here. Right, so this predicate just checks that this equality holds. Um, so it will check if the, if the factors of length n starting at position i and j are cyclic shifts of each other. Okay, here's a sort of random property of, uh, or pattern uh, of words which we'll call a mesosome, which is something from biology. It's just a word of the form x, x prime, where x prime is a conjugate of x uh, different from x itself. And again, you can represent this property um, using the conjugate uh, formula and, well, the formula for mesosome is actually pretty simple to check. Right? It just checks that, yeah, x and x prime are conjugates and that they're not equal. And if I want to find just all the lengths for which there are mesosomes in the 2A Morse word, I just quantify on i and I'll get an automaton giving me all the length n, right? In this case, it's this thing here, which is also a little bit complicated. So can you necessarily write down in a clean way what, the, what n's are accepted and what aren't is maybe not so easy, but you can see, for example, that there are for sure cycles involving accepting states, cycles reaching non-accepting states, so infinitely many n are accepted, infinitely many n are rejected, right? So you can deduce things like that. So there are mesosomes of infinitely many uh, possible lengths. Here's another standard property, well-studied property in combinatorics on words, the property of a word being primitive, uh, which basically means that it is not a power. It's not a square or a cube or any higher power, right? Um, now to be able to test this with walnut, it's maybe better to use this equivalent characterization of being primitive, right? And it's, I think, an easy exercise to show that the two definitions are equivalent. So equivalently, a word is primitive if no non-trivial rotation of itself if it does not equal any non-trivial rotation of itself. Right, so that's the one we can use here to check um, whether or not a factor or a subword of, a, of a, a sequence is primitive, right? So basically, well, if a word does equal some shift of itself, Let's say the shift is, in this case, by J, by J symbols. Well, then the first J symbols will match the last J symbols, and the first I, the first N minus J symbols will match the last N minus J symbols, 
and you just check that, right? So the formula is easy to write down. We can apply that, for example, to this period doubling word, which was one of the words I showed you last time. Um, suppose I want to know what, uh, which of the prefixes of this word are primitive. Right, so again, I'll write down uh, or define a formula for checking equality of factors in this word. The formula here for being primitive, right, so it's saying it's not true that uh, two factors are shifts, uh, or that a factor is equal to a shift of itself. And the last command simply just checks the prefixes, right? Starting at position zero, length n, it will give me all the, all the lengths of the primitive prefixes, right? Or it'll give me an automaton telling me the lengths of all the pr primitive prefixes. In this case, you can see that this automaton accepts all binary representations of positive numbers, right? So it, it accepts all the, all the positive numbers, so every prefix of this period doubling word is primitive. And again, you may or may not want to try and see how hard that is to prove by hand. It might not be that hard, I don't know, I didn't try, but it's harder than doing this. Something else you can, uh, you can check with Walnut. You can compare words with respect to lexicographic order, right? So in this case, the lexicographical order is defined as follows. Um, a word W is less than a word X if one of two things, either W is a prefix of X or if W is not a prefix of X, then W agrees with X for a while, and then at a certain point, um, the next symbol of W is less than the, mat the corresponding symbol in X, right? So that's the definition, right? Not too hard to write down a formula for it again. So what do we do this time? So OK, right away we can check uh, the prefix part. So here's the formula for being a prefix, right? So it's saying that uh, the factor of length m starting at position i is a prefix of the factor of length n starting at position j. And so you just check, OK, do they agree for the first m terms? Right, so now you have your formula for prefix. So to check the lexicographic order, you check, okay, well, either it's a prefix, right? Or you check the other condition, which is, uh, okay, they agree for a while up to some t, right? So there exists some t, they agree on the first t positions, and then the next position after that, this guy is less than this guy. All right. So here's a, a fairly silly property to check. Um, property that is somewhat obvious if you use the morphism definition of two a mores, but it just says, okay, if um, the factor of length n starting at position i is less than the one starting at position j, then the factor starting at position 2i of length 2n is less than the one starting at position 2j of length 2n. Right? It's something very easy to see from the morphism if you understand how it works, but here's how you do it in Walnut. So here again is our equality of factors formula 
our prefix formula, our lexicographic ordering formula, right? So there's the, we check the prefix part, uh, or we check the other condition, right, that it agrees up to some t, and then one of them is less than the other, which in this case we have to kind of write like this, because we don't actually have a, a less than operation on the values of the automatic sequence, right? Remember this at references the actual output value of the automatic sequence, right? So it says that it's um, this guy is zero and this guy is one. We can't, we don't actually have a less than operation on those things. Cause, well, they could be letters, for example, right? One could be an A and one could be a B or something. So we just say one of them is zero and one of them is one. And, oh, then, then we just encode this check here, and it says true. So it checks that that um, property is true. Another one that is actually, can also be quite useful to know for certain um, automatic sequences is to be able to understand the lengths of the runs in the sequence, right? So a run is just uh, a string of consecutive uh, occurrences of some letter A. Uh, in this case, we'll say it's a maximal run if it is maximal, right? If it can't be continue to either to the right or to the left. Some people just say that is the run. Runs are maximal runs, right? So again, this is pretty easy to check, right? Here's a, um, a formula for it, right? So this part here is just checking that there is a run of n consecutive a's. And then we check here that it cannot be extended one position further to the right. All right, so just check that it can't be extended one position to the right. We check here that it cannot be extended one position to the left, right? Or that we're just at the beginning already and therefore it can't be extended to the left, right? So we can get a formula for, you know, all the runs starting at position i that have length n. So there it is, right? If, we, if I just care about the lengths of the runs, right, I just quantify the positions, right? Just say there exists an i, and then I'll get just the lengths, if that's all I care about. And if I want to check that there are arbitrarily long runs, of some letter, right? Here again is a formula for it, right? It just says for any m, I can find a run longer than m, right? So for example, if I want to check that this Cantor sequence contains arbitrarily long runs of zeros, but not arbitrarily long runs of ones, right? So in this case, the Cantor sequence is defined as the characteristic sequence of the numbers whose base three representation are just zeros and twos, right? And I mean, from the definition, it's obvious that you can't have one one Right, because if you had a number whose base three representation is just zeros and twos, well, the next number, add one, it's gonna create a one somewhere, right? So it's pretty clear that you can't have one one, so you can't have any longer runs of ones, and it's also pretty easy to see that you must have arbitrarily long runs of zeros, right? Have some number that starts with a one and then a whole bunch of zeros, and then you just increment and you'll get a big long run like this. But again, as an exercise, let's 
input this into Walnut and have Walnut check this for us, right? So, okay, this um, canter is a base three thing. So we're working in base three. Then here's the formula to check for a run of zeros, right? Again, check this run of zeros, can't be extended to the right, can't be extended to the left. Do the same thing for runs of ones. And then just check the, the formula we saw before that checks that there are arbitrarily long runs of each. And Walnut will return true in the first case and false in the second case, which of course we could have deduced easily from the definition. Palindromes. Palindromes are another well-studied type of, type of word or type of repetition, if you like, uh, right? I mean, we know what a palindrome is. Our problem here is to find the lengths of the palindromic factors in the Fibonacci word, right? Which you will remember from the last lecture. Right, so, well, I guess you can see the, the check we have to do, right? To check for a palindrome, just start from the ends and check. Right? So we can put that formula into Walnut here. Um, remember to tell it that we're working now in the Fibonacci numeration system, right? And if I input this command into Walnut, it will produce an automaton accepting the length n, for which there is a palindrome of length n in the Fibonacci word. And in this case, if you look at the automaton, you will see that it accepts every valid Fibonacci representation, right? So in this case, I mean, right, you'll see that it doesn't accept a 1-1, one, one, anything with a 1-1, one, one, but we knew already that the Fibonacci numeration language does not contain uh, those 1-1s. One, so to interpret this, you have to understand what the underlying numeration language is, right? But in this case, we can see that it does accept every uh, valid Fibonacci repre uh, representation. So it accepts all integers n, which means that the Fibonacci word contains a palindrome of every length. Okay. So that, that was a, you know, a big long sequence of examples. Um, containing a lot of the, the typical sort of properties of, um, of these sequences that we are interested in in combinatorics on words. So hopefully that may be of some use to you for anyone who's staying for the final week of the conference. Um, so an obvious question after seeing a whole bunch of properties that you can check with Walnut is what sort of things can't you check with Walnut, right? So what things can you check? What things can't you check? So I'll spend a little bit of time discussing the limitations and the limitations I'll consider under two different categories. First, what sequences, what types of sequences can Walnut be used with, A, and B, what properties can be tested of, you know, let's say it can work with certain sequences, what are the, what, type, what types of properties can be expressed in this logic that we can test? Okay, so Walnut can be used with all of, fairly wide variety of 
what we called in the last lecture morphic sequences, right? So sequences generated by iterating a morphism, applying a coding at the end. And remember we had this equivalence, right, of k-automatic sequences with uh, sequences generated by iterating a k-uniform morphism. But we've also seen that Walnut can be used with certain non-uniformly morphic sequences, right? It can work with the Fibonacci sequence, which is defined by iterating the non-uniform morphism, 0 goes to 0, 1, 1 goes to 0, right? And I mentioned briefly that the important thing here, in the, at least in the non-uniform case, is that somehow there has to be some underlying numeration system for which the addition relation can be computed by a finite automaton, right? And there was such an automaton for the Fibonacci numeration system, right? The Fibonacci base numeration system. There is some big 17 state automaton, I think first found by Jean Burstel. So at least we can work with uh, the Fibonacci sequence and related sequences. Of course, this extends to a number of other um, numeration sequences where the, you know, the, the sequence of place values um, well, in, in most of the time they're you know, they said, well, they, they, yeah, they satisfy some linear recurrence, and we get things like Tribonacci, or, you know, if you look at the sequence of Pell numbers, that gives you another numeration system, and you can compute with sequences related to the Pell numeration system. But, Walnut will not be able to work with all morphic sequences. So I'll give you an example of a sequence for which, which this theory does not work for. And well, it's the question that uh, Alexander asked me last, last lecture. So here's a morphic sequence, right, defined by this non-uniform morphism. A maps to ABCC, B maps to BCC, C goes to C. Right, you start iterating, you generate this thing, and you'll see that the Bs are in positions 1, 4, 9, 16, etc. right? So if you map, you know, the A's and C's to 0, the B's to 1, you get the characteristic sequence of the squares, right? So this particular morphic sequence knows about squares, square numbers. And I claim that if I had a decidable theory that included this sequence, well, I, I claim that I don't, that any, any theory, any logical uh, extension of Pressburger that included this, uh, this particular sequence would be an undecidable theory, right? And the, I, the idea is, once I have squares, I can actually define multiplication. And I told you last time that the first order theory of the natural numbers with addition and multiplication was an undecidable theory, right? So I'll just show you how you define multiplication from the squares. Okay, so let's say we have a predicate for the squares, right? If I have that morphic sequence, I have a predicate for the squares, right? It can tell me if a number is a square. All right, so let's call that S. S is a predicate for the squares. Given a predicate for the squares, I can define the function y equals x squared in the following way. I say, okay, well, wh y, if y is equal to x squared, then the next square is y plus 2x plus 1, 
right? That's the next square. So I check that y is a square. I check that y plus 2x plus 1 is a square. And I check that there are no squares in between those two, right? If there are no other squares in between those two, then y plus 2x plus 1 is the next square, and therefore y must equal x squared, right? So I can compute the function y equals x squared. And if I can do that, I can get multiplication by checking this, right? Because this guy here has to be x, x times y, right? And then I can check you know, that these guys are squares and everything's x squared, y squared, and et cetera, right? So if I have those, I can check any multiplication x times y. Right, so I can define, I can, uh, I can define multiplication once I, once I have a predicate for the squares, which, I mean, may be kind of surprising, right? That just having a predicate for the squares with addition, you can define multiplication, and once you have multiplication, um, you have an undecidable theory. So, Okay, so I can't possibly hope for um, a decision procedure that would apply to all morphic sequences, right? So the other question is then, okay, for the ones that it does apply to, um, what properties can I test of the automatic sequence, right? And we saw a whole bunch, right? I listed a whole bunch periodicity, square-free, overlap-free, whatever, palindromes, this, that, right? Um, so what are, th what are these? Can we classify what properties um, can be checked, right? So by property, I just mean a language, right? I, I just want to check membership in a language, right? The language of squares or the language of palindromes or whatever. And, okay, yeah, like I said, here's a few that I showed you that we know how to check, right? So here's a few properties that for sure, we've seen the formulas, we know how to write them down uh, in this logic. Squares, palindromes, primitive words, etc. Well, the class of languages of this type that we can actually check um, or that we can actually express in this um, logic is called, is a class of languages called F0 plus, right? Basically, well, first order with addition. And it's a bizarre class of languages at least bizarre in terms of the usual Chomsky hierarchy of languages, regular, context-free, whatever. Um, the reason it's bizarre is because it contains things that I would consider complicated, like squares, right? The language of squares is a non-regular language at any rate. It's kind of complicated, at least relative to, you know, regular languages, but it does not contain these really stupid languages, like just the language of strings that contain an even number of ones. This seems like the most simple language you could even think of. But this, this language is not expressible in this logic, right? It's, it's, it's such a simple language, right? And it's, it's weird. It's weird that the, you, know, you have this class of languages that, has these, that can express complicated things like squares and primitive words. Primitive words is a really complicated class of languages. No, it's not, well, it's assumed to not be context-free. I don't know if that was proved, but but then it doesn't contain this really stupid language. 
and it doesn't contain, for example, this Dick language, which would be a context-free language, right? It's the language of balance parentheses. Right? You just pretend zero is a left parenthesis and one is a right parenthesis, and you have the language of properly parenthesized strings. That's not in there. Uh, abelian squares, so abelian squares are words of the form x, x prime, where x can be obtained by rearranging uh, the letters of x. That's not in there. So all these things are not expressible in, in this logic. So you cannot, you cannot directly test for them using Walnut. However, sometimes there are tricks where you can sometimes reformulate a property in a different way that is expressible or do some other tricks. Um, so there is a, a way to actually check parity, um, but I won't get into it, but there are some tricks. Uh, another one that seems like it would not be expressible would be the property of being balanced. Balanced in the sense of Sturmian words. So a word is balanced if whenever you look at two factors of the same length, those two factors, if you, for each letter A, if you count the number of A's in each of the two factors, that uh, difference can be at most one. All right. So, we have this, um, okay, we have this property, right? Balanced words. Now, it seems like this property should not be expressible in our first order logic because it involves counting numbers of, you know, numbers of, of A's in the word, right? And we saw that, you know, we, we couldn't do parity. We couldn't, we, you know, we couldn't count, not even mod two, we couldn't count occurrences of letters. So how were we gonna count occurrences of letters here to check if, um, if these things are balanced? But in this case, it turns out that we get lucky. There in the binary, over the binary alphabet, there's an equivalent definition of being balanced that we can check. So, again, this would be something well known in the theory of Sturmian words. A word is balanced, uh, wait, unbalanced, unbalanced. That's a mistake, unbalanced, All right? If it contains two things of the form, zero V zero and one V one, right? Obviously that is unbalanced. Right, because one guy has two more zeros than the, than the other guy, right? And they're only allowed to differ by one. So, okay, I should fix that. Unbalanced. Um, right, and this we can check, right? This is easy to check. I mean, you could easily write down the, the formula to check this, right? Just to check if there are two occurrences of things that look like that, zero v zero, one v one. Right, so it turns out that in this case, uh, you can um, express the property of being balanced, and in the exercises, you're asked to verify that the Fibonacci um, sequence is a balanced sequence. So every factor of the Fibonacci word is balanced. Okay, so, um, so that was the use so far of Walnut basically to test certain properties of an automatic sequence. You know, it answers true or false. Does it have squares? Does it have palindromes? Uh, it can also be used to do some enumeration where it can count um, certain things, right? For example, the, the classical sort of counting problem is the, the subword complexity problem, 
or the factor complexity problem, right? Just for each n, count how many factors of length n, how many distinct factors of length n are there in the sequence. All right, that's sort of the, the classical one. Um, okay, so it, it, can, it can count certain things. And the way it um, represents the answer is something called a linear representation. So I should tell you how that works. Okay, so I'm only going to define it over for, for the binary base 2 case. The generalization to base k is obvious. Uh, so a linear representation for some function, right? I have some function um, from natural numbers to natural numbers. A linear representation for it is a row vector v, a column vector w, and then a pair of matrices, m0 and m1 in the binary case. Obviously, base k, you'd have m0, m1, m2 up to mk minus 1. So you have one matrix for each digit. And the way it works is, if you want to compute the, the value of f of i, you write i in binary, right? You write i in binary, and then you multiply the corresponding matrices, right? You just follow the binary representation, and you multiply the corresponding matrices. Right, and then of course you have the row vector v and the column vector w, and you get an answer, f of i. Right, so this is, this is a linear representation. So here is an example of a linear representation for a function. In this case, the function f of n equals n times n plus one over two. Okay, so here's the linear representation, right? It's a, a binary, a linear representation. So here's my matrix for the digit zero, my matrix for the digit one, my row vector, my column vector, right? And with this linear representation, I can compute this function. Like I said, if I want to know what f of four is, I write down four in binary, so I write down one, zero, zero, and then I multiply the matrices m1 times m0 times m0, right, with my v and my w, just multiply it all together, I get 10, which is what I'm supposed to get, right? Yeah? So for every n, and for every integer n, you have additional v, w, and m0, and m1. No, 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 these are fixed, these are fixed. No, no, the output is a, is a single, is a scalar, right? Right, if I, if I have my row vector of size four here, my column vector of size one here, it's just, it all becomes a scalar, a single, a single number, right? And what Walnut does is it is able to compute a linear representation for the following problem, right? So remember, if I give Walnut a formula with a bunch of free variables, um, it will produce an automaton accepting the base k representations of the free variables that satisfy the formula. What it can do is, as a function of one of those variables, it can count the number of values of the other free variables that satisfy the formula, right? So, and it will output a linear representation for that thing. So, here's an example of how to use Walnut to get the linear representation I showed you. Right, so remember the function was uh, f of n equals n times n plus 1 over 2, right? Well, 
that counts the number of, well, the number of pairs ij that satisfied this formula. Right? It just, right? It just, it counts the number of pairs ij for which i is less than j, j less than or equal to n. It's exactly that, that many pairs, right? And this is a formula that I can easily plug into walnut, right? So what this is going to do, right, it's, it's using the same eval command, but now I just add in this variable here, right? And this will give me, as a function of n, the number of pairs i and j that satisfy the formula. That has to be a finite number for this to work, right? But what it will do is it will give me a linear representation for the function of n that counts the number of pairs i, j that satisfy the formula, right? Provided that is a finite number. So in this case, that's how I got that linear representation, the one I showed you, right? I just put this command into walnut and it output, and it, do, it does it, it outputs it in a, as a, in a maple file format. But you can just open it in a text editor and see the matrices and copy it into Sage or whatever you want to do. Oh, went too far. Okay, so here's an example of just counting something in um, some automatic sequence. So for example, I take this characteristic sequence of the powers of two that's built into walnut as the word P2. If I want to count the number of ones in a prefix of length n, right, I just write this formula, right, i less than n, P2 of i is a one, right? If I put this n here into the eval command, it will give me a linear representation that will count as a function of n how many i's satisfy the formula. In other words, how many ones there are in that prefix of length n, right? And I should mention that for technical reasons having to do with leading zeros, you normally have to actually take the, the v vector of the linear representation and multiply it by m0 until that stabilizes, just to deal with some leading zero stuff. It's a technicality that I won't get too into, but here is the linear representation I get from that command. So this is a linear representation that counts the number of ones in the prefix of length n of that power of two sequence. So again, if I want to know what um, the answer is for length nine, right, the prefix of length nine, I write nine in binary, one, zero, zero, one. I multiply the matrices, m1, m0, m0, m1, times v on the left, w on the right, and it will give me the answer four. And you can check that there are four ones in that prefix of length nine, right? Okay, I won't get too much into that. Okay, one, one last topic, one last topic before we stop. Uh, K-synchronized uh, sequences, or K-synchronized functions. So a function is K-synchronized if these pairs, n, f of n, if n and f of n can be recognized in parallel by a finite automaton. All right, we'll call that K-synchronized. And here's an example of a function that is K-synchronized. Right, the function that counts, f of n, the function that tells me the position of the first time I see a square of period n in the 2a Morse word. 
All right, so I don't know, when's the first time, for each n, when's the first time I see a square of period n in the 2a Morse word? So I can put that again, I can write down the formulas I need, right? The formula for factor equality, the formula for square we saw before, the first square, right? Pretty easy formula to write down. I just check that, okay, at position i, there is a square at every previous position, I mean a square of period n, and at every previous position, there is no square of period n, right? And what I will get is I will get this automaton. Again, accepting the pairs i comma n. So i is my f of n, right? That's the position of the first square of period n, right? So this is computing that function f of n uh, comma n. And if you look at this, you can, um, you can write down the languages that this automaton accepts. In this case, it's very simple, so you can just look at it and write it down, right? And you can notice that in the first case, it just accepts, right? It accepts one, then zero, 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 right? So the in the first case, it accepts pairs of the form two to the n, two to the n, right? That means that the first occurrence of a square of period, okay, two to the k, is a position two to the k, right? And if you look at the other guy, uh, if you look at the first component, it goes one, zero, one, one, which spells 11, right? And the second component has some leading zeros and then goes one, one, spells three. So it's telling me that the first occurrence of a square of period three times two to the k is at position 11 times two to the k, right? So it also tells you that the only periods of squares are two to the k and three times two to the k, right? So those are the, it tells you the lengths of the squares and it tells you the first time I see a square of that length, right? Okay, abelian stuff. Remember I told you abelian squares are words of the form xy, where y is an anagram, right, a rearrangement of x, right? So yeah, abelian properties are based on this equi abelian equivalence relation that involves counting, right? X and y are abelian equivalent if for each alphabet symbol, the, it ha the x and the y have the same number uh, of occurrences of each alphabet symbol. Uh, and I told you already that that sort of counting stuff is not expressible in general. But for certain sequences, um, you can do some abelian stuff. So for example, in the 2a Morse word, you can do uh, you can look at abelian properties. So you can, for example, you can count the abelian complexity of the 2a Morse word, where you count the number of distinct factors of length n, except you count under the equivalence relation, the abelian equivalence relation, right? So you count the number of equivalence classes of factors of length n under the abelian equivalence relation. Right, so for example, 0, 1, and 1, 0 are abelian equivalent, so the 2a Morse word actually has three distinct abelian equivalence classes of length 2. Right, and I said, okay, normally you can't express this um, property uh, in our logic, but the 2a Morse word is very simple. It's just concatenations of the two blocks, 0, 1, and 1, 0. Right? So most of the time you know exactly how many zeros and ones there are. Right? Like certainly in any even length prefix, you know there are exactly the same numbers of zeros and ones. Right? And in an odd length prefix, well, okay, there's, you know, there's the same number in the, the first 2n 
positions, and then you just have to check the next one. Right, so it's pretty easy to, whoops, to check this, right? So, yeah, yeah, like I said, right, if I have an even length prefix, right, then there are n over two zeros and n over two ones. And if I have an odd prefix, well, there's n minus one over two zeros, and then I check the last symbol, and if it's a zero, I add one, right? So that I can easily write down, right? I can just check, right? If I want to check in the prefix of length n, right? So write n as 2t plus r, where r is either 0 or 1, right? If r is 0, then I have t zeros in that prefix. And if r is 1, so if I'm in the odd case, then I just look at the last symbol. Right? And if it's a zero, I add, I add an extra one. Right? And so I get this automaton here, right, that will compute uh, the pairs n, s. Right? So for n, n is the length of the prefix, and s is the number of zeros. Right? So this is, uh, this is a two synchronized function. And now, given that, I can find the um, number of zeros in an arbitrary factor, right, in the middle of the 2a Morse word by just counting the zeros, right, let's say it goes from position i to position i plus n, right, well I just take the prefix of length i plus n, find how many zeros, find how many zeros of the prefix of length i, subtract, and I get the number of zeros in that factor, right? So I can do that, all right? So that's implemented here. Um, and of course, if I know my word has length n and I have whatever, s zeros, then I have n minus s ones, since it's a binary thing. And I get this horrible thing. I get this horrible, terrible, ugly automaton. Right, but I mean the point is I can do it. Right? I can I can compute the you know the abelian equivalence classes and I can count them and I can do uh, do various things. Right? So yeah, if I want to compute whether or not two factors are abelian equivalent, I just check, right, if they have the same number of zeros. and I get an even crazier automaton, which I will not show you. Okay. Oh. All right, I'll show you quickly, last, last topic. Last topic. So I'll show you again how to define synchronized functions in the Fibonacci base rather than the, the integer base. And I'm going to show you that these functions are Fibonacci synchronized. So I can compute the pairs n, floor of 5n, in parallel, right, reading their Fibonacci representations. And the way you do it is you make use of this fact, which is not completely obvious, but is a known fact, that basically if you have a number, well, I mean, okay, in the integer base, if, in base k, if you have some number written in base k and you add a zero, you're multiplying by k, right? Basically the same happens with Fibonacci. If you have a number in the Fibonacci base and you add a zero at the end, you multiply by the golden ratio phi here, more or less, right? There's this, the formula is a little more complicated, but basically you multiply by phi, right? So it's more or less working the same way as an integer base. It's just slightly more complicated. So if you add two zeros, you multiply by phi squared. 
right? And you can define this function, right? I'm going to compute this function here, phi, phi of n floor, right? And I do it using this, um, this observation, right, that, well, if I sort of do this shift to the left by adding a zero, right, I'm basically doing the multiplication by phi, right? So here's a regular expression to accept the pairs where you have one string and then the other string shifted with a zero added, right? And then this command here just verifies this formula, right? So I have two of them, one for phi and one for phi squared. So for phi squared, I gotta do the shift twice, right? And add two. And that lets me compute automata that accept the Fibonacci representations of these two relatively famous sets, the upper and lower Wythoff sets. Right, so there's the definition, right? The, the lower Wythoff set is just, uh, you know, all numbers of the form floor phi of n. And once I have my automaton for phi of n and phi squared of n, it's easy to write down the definition of the lower Wythoff numbers and the upper Wythoff numbers, right? They're the automata that accept them. They're actually very simple, right? Obviously, one is the complement of the other. Well, not obviously, but one is the complement of the other. And the point is, I can prove, well, one can prove results of this form. All numbers greater than or equal to four can be written as the sum of two lower Wythoff numbers. Right, this is a fairly non-trivial result of number theory, but it can be verified more or less immediately, right? I just write exactly, right? N is the sum of A plus B, A plus B, or lower Wythoff numbers, right? And I showed you the commands that generated the appropriate automata there. And Walnut will check, and it will return, well, it will check what numbers, what numbers can be written this way and it will ver verify that all numbers bigger than four, as well as two, are expressible as the sum of two lower Wythoff numbers. Right, so, I mean, you can, this is, the, I mean, this is, you know, most of what I showed you, you know, those sort of easy properties of squares and whatnot were, were pretty simple examples, but this, this is, you know, this is a recent, research level result in additive number theory, right? So this is, you know, this is a fairly non-trivial result. Um, so I just wanted to end by showing you uh, that and to mention finally in the last minute, there's a, there is another related uh, piece of software called PCAN, which implements this, uh, theory that I've shown you here, right, of k-automatic sequences, but extends it to the class of Sturmian words, and it lets you prove similar properties for the entire class of Sturmian words, like you can actually prove statements about all Sturmian words, like statements of the form all Sturmian words are aperiodic, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it was implemented by a student, Reed, Oi, who passed away two years ago at the age of 23. Uh, just here's, here's an example of it from his web page. But yeah, it can prove things like Sturmian words are not periodic, Sturmian words contain palindromes of every length, blah, blah, blah. Right, so I just wanted to mention that, yeah, there's also this kind of extension uh, to Walnut. That's it. Thank you. Any questions?
the photograph about the last uh, uh, code you wrote about putting the width of the box, it seems like one has to actually input every end and that checks it. It's not uh, the improve it for all ends. It's more of a check. Um, well, this one here will check for all n. So yeah, I mean, okay, in the first formula, yeah, it's true, n is unquantified here, but in the second formula, I'll just check that all, for all sufficiently large n, this holds, and I'll get okay, true. So I don't think so. I can't think of how to do it. And, and uh, with the dual function to compute the abelian, uh, yes, the abelian complexity of tumor, do you, can you detect that this complexity is bounded? Yes. And so you, you know that the valence of the tumor is bounded. Yes, that's true. In this case, yeah. Actually, yeah, no, for, you could def for 2 Morse word, for sure, you could definitely calculate the, the balance function of, of, any, of any factor. Yep, for sure. Any other Uh, yeah, so I very briefly mentioned uh, in, the, in the last lecture that the, the number, every time you have a, an alternation of quantifiers in your formula, you potentially, in, in theory, get another exponential level uh, blow up. So in practice, this sounds really bad for Almost anything that I've shown you here, the computation is more or less instantaneous. There's, I mean, for anything that I showed you here, it's, there's, there's no issue. Um, but the more, the more complicated your formula is, especially, for example, if you were working with, um, let's say, very long uniform morphisms, then you'd be working in a, over a huge base. Right, um, that could uh, that could lead to a large blow up, um, or yeah, just really complicated formulas with lots of lots of variables and lots of uh, quantifier alternations will produce um, could produce a sort of explosion in the number of states, um, and yeah, I mean for for everything we've we've done here and whatever's in the exercises, it will be done more or less instantaneously. But in terms of like some of the research, like published results that Jeffrey Shallot has done with Walnut, you know, he's had to use, you know, computing systems with several hundred gigabytes of RAM sometimes to, to store the, the massive intermediate uh, DFAs and the computations may run for a couple of days or, or whatever. So sometimes, depending on what you're doing, they can be very big. I actually don't know. I know for sure it can do s all Sturmian words. I don't know if it can, I, I, yeah, I actually haven't used it much to, to be able to say, I, yeah, I don't know if it, can, if it can do that as well for like all two automatic words. Yeah, I, sorry.
Um, from personal experience, I haven't done too much myself. Definitely, yes, there's, I mean, in terms of just the, the syntax and, and using Walnut, it will absolutely handle uh, multi-dimensional um, automatic sequences. Um, it's true that I haven't myself worked much with it in terms of, yeah, I mean, maybe whatever properties you would be interested in checking for multi-dimensional sequences might, yeah, they, they might be complicated enough that they would result in a, a big computational blow up. Uh, I was told that, for example, checking the minimality of um, maybe it was an animal or something like that. But checking minimality of some rather simple dish sequence uh, uh, that shows them on this. Ah, uh, really? Okay. So maybe it was not like a super simple one. But mm -hmm. Yeah, th that's a good question. I should I should try it on on some two dimensional sequence and and see what it does. So let me just comment on the comment then. Uh, it's exactly what you said before. Um, so the morphisms are twenty dimensional, twenty dimensional really, already used for one And in dimension two, you have twice twice as many variables, so you have twice as many exponential growers. So it's it's not. There are no more questions, let's send uh, that.